author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Thank you so much for joining me, Susan. Oh, it's my pleasure. I just have to tell you that reading The Village Effect really struck a chord with me. It, it's the type of book I feel like everyone should read, and by doing so would greatly impact their lives. So tell us um, just a little bit about the book. Sure. You know, this book began where my last one ended, where I was left with this question, why do women all over the developed world live longer lives than men do? And I discovered that a big piece of that puzzle had to do with women's social lives. In general, women tend to develop and groom their social contacts throughout their lifespans. They look for people they like to work with. They keep in contact with their extended family. They're in touch with their neighbors. They're the ones who send the Christmas cards, who host the holiday dinners. And... Much of this was undervalued for a long time, but now there's a new field of social neuroscience which is starting to reveal the importance of these social contacts, that these social contacts have a hormonal effect, they have a cognitive effect, they have a, an impact on our immunity and, and our health. So I'm using the idea of the village or the village effect as a metaphor to re represent that kind of social contact. That, the kind of social contact that we all need to survive and thrive and to live long, healthy lives. And I know in the book, you talk about how having really rich social ties are just as important as diet and exercise to your health and, and how it can even impact the growth of cancer within the body. Tell us a little bit more about that. It's interesting in that our relationships have an effect on our bodies and brains, just as the reverse is true. Our bodies and brains, of course, affect our health and and our relationships, in fact. There's kind of a, a, a mutual uh, dependence happening. And what is being revealed in science now is that people who have large, connected, in-person social lives have a longevity advantage. Let's start with that. They have an advantage of two to 15 years on people who are much more solitary. And that just blew me away. Or the studies that are coming out about women with breast cancer have found that those who have very intense, larger in-person social networks have four times the survival rates as women who are much more solitary. So if this is particularly important at a time when many of us are actually spending more time alone just because of the internet age. We don't have to cross paths with our neighbors anymore. We don't have to talk to people we don't want to talk to. We don't really go to the newsstand to buy our newspapers. Some of us don't even have regular classrooms who go to school. We do that online. We don't go to bookstores or libraries. All of this happens in the virtual world. And what is being lost there are a couple of things. Most importantly, that middle layer of relationships, which we're discovering from science, is incredibly protective. So not just the people who are very close to us, but that middle layer of, you know, our teachers, our neighbors, the person we meet every day where we buy, you know, a few things at the corner store or, you know, the people you might cross paths with at a meeting every week or at, you know, when you play cards or a book club. It turns out that those relationships are tremendously important and protective for our happiness and our immunity. And this is something that was completely new to me. I didn't know that before I started the book. The meta-analyses, meaning the studies that put together all the information on a certain subject that we have and control for chance, tell us that more than anything else we can control, our social interaction is the most predictive of how long we will live. So in researching your book, what were you most floored by? What, you, what, what shocked you? Was there anything you came across that you were like, wow, I would have never expected that? There were so many, you know, points at which that happened. Because to be frank, I started out with the basic question, but I didn't have all the little bits and pieces. And to, to be frank, a lot of these bits and pieces not only got filled along the way, so I had to constantly rejuggle the pieces of the book, but they're still floating in. So the book is out there, but I'm learning new 
new research all the time. So one of the things that floored me as a parent, for example, was a study that was done on preteen girls where they compared the impact of a visit, a phone conversation, telephone conversation, a text, and no contact on kids' stress levels. Now, most of us, myself included, thought that it's just the information that counts, the actual words. But the study essentially divided this group of girls into four equal kind of subgroups and gave them, they stressed them out on purpose, and then they measured the biological levels of stress. So how much cortisol was in their saliva, which is a sign of stress, or how much oxytocin is in their urine, um, or, you know, which is a sign of being comforted, having the effect of social comfort, okay, or somebody reaching out to you, you'll secrete oxytocin. And they stressed these girls out by asking them to solve math and, and word problems within a time limit in front of an audience. I mean, any adult would just burst a gasket if they had to do that, but these were preteen girls, so it was even worse for them because they're so worried about how they appear to others. And after, they measured their cortisol and oxytocin levels before and after the test, and they found that the girls had the biggest drop in cortisol, meaning the biggest reduction of stress, after a visit from mom, where they might get a pat or a hug or some sort of physical reassurance along with mom saying, you know, good job, or I'm so proud of you. Next came a, a, like a slightly lower drop of cortisol levels when there was a phone call from mom, when they could hear her voice. And then the last two groups where they, mom sent a text saying, you know, you were so great, I saw you on television, and I'm so proud of you, and how are you feeling now, all in text form, okay, meaning just the words had the same impact as the control group, meaning no contact at all. In other words, it had no effect on the girls' stress levels. And that just shocked me because how many of us have sent a text to a friend or a child or a spouse or a, a you know, boyfriend or girlfriend saying, you know, I'm with you or, you know, wishing you luck on your test or bon voyage. Essentially, it's not so much that, but what we call in science the honest signals that matter. Like, making eye contact, that little like fist bump or, or pat or hug or handshake, that really gives you the burst of oxytocin that helps damp down your stress and provide some of the protection that we were talking about earlier. And I'm right there with you because when I read that, it made me think of all of my friends who that's their main source of contact is text. And I'm like, ah. Oh. No wonder. <laughs> it's just, it does not work for me. <laughs> no, and because when, for example, you know, we're talking to each other and we hear each other's pauses and the expression on each other's faces. And if we were, you know, sitting in the same room talking, it would be even a little bit better. We'd get a little bit more of an advantage in terms of establishing rapport. Um, so this is something that's extremely important in business, for example, or even say your, your audience, I think, is writers. When they want to interview somebody for a story, it's just so important to be there. And in the book, I talk about going to Sardinia to investigate super longevity. And so much of that story, I had to be there. I had to see how those seniors were never left alone, how they were treated by their neighbors, their children, their grandchildren, how the village was so cohesive. If, if I hadn't been there to, experiencing it, to experience it, it wouldn't have come alive, I think in the book in the same way. Whether or not you're an introvert or extrovert, does that matter in terms of the amount of social contact you need? It does matter, but with an important proviso, which is that we all need social contact. And I think a good analogy is seeing it as some of us have small appetites and some of us have more expansive appetites. And, but we all have to eat because it's a biological drive. And social contact is also a biological drive. So I think the introverts need less, perhaps, and they need a certain type that they have to determine for themselves of what is comfortable for them. Uh, but they still need social contact. And in fact, the research shows that, paradoxically, introverts who don't get social contact are sick more often. They get more colds and other types of viruses. So you think it would be the reverse, because if you go out there and see people, you're you know more likely to be in touch with whatever you know, viruses and bacteria out there, but in fact, it boosts your immunity. So it's very important to think of it, in my view, as a drive, and that 
some of us, I think, are just not getting enough because so much of our lives have migrated online. What is the main takeaway you want your readers to have after reading The Village Effect? I think that the main takeaway is that we've never been more hyper-connected than we are now, but we've never been lonelier as a species. And I think that the face-to-face contact is something that provides a lot of satisfaction and happiness in the present, but also protects us well into the future, protects our cognitive function, our memories, our ability to solve problems. And this is important not only as we age, but especially important for children. And did researching and writing this book have an effect on how you live your life? And if so, how? It absolutely changed me, Ingrid, because I, you know, as I learned more and more about it, and some of it was really a surprise to me, and I think it'll be a surprise to the reader, I realized I had to change my ways. I mean, I'm a pretty social person, but my job is a solitary job for much of the year um, because I'm a writer, and you need a lot of kind of quiet, connected time to focus on what you're doing, to do your research and to write and to revise. But I began to realize that I would get so much more bang for my buck if I did things every day, if I made sure I had social contact Every day, for example, I used to swim laps at the pool to keep fit, and now I swim with a team. And in fact, I write a lot of stories about the swim team in the book because it was so transformative. It provided kind of the work environment that I was missing as a writer. I used to be a clinical psychologist, and I had social contact in my workplace through a clinic and through teaching in the university. But as I spent more and more time writing, um, I didn't realize how much that was affecting me. So it, it forced me to look at my day and to say, by 2.30, if I hadn't been out there and seen a group of people who I know, that I had to get out there and do that. Um, so it changed that about me, um, for sure. And it also, I guess, it kind of refreshed my point of view about what's necessary to be healthy. You know, before I thought, just like everybody else, you know, preparing healthy food and you know, getting fresh air now and then and getting regular exercise was what I needed. But now I realize that I actually need to keep in contact with the people who really matter to me face to face. I need to see them face to face or those relationships are going to decay. That's one of the things that I learned. So, for example, I was recently in New Haven in New York for work and I stayed in extra, extra few days just to see a friend who happened to be coming up from Colombia in in South America to make sure I had a chance to see him because the book has taught me that if you don't see people face to face within say 18 months to two, three years, that relationship fades away. So I know that you've written, this is your second book now. Mm -hmm. Um, What lessons after writing your first book, The Sexual Paradox, did you take into writing this one? Was it easier for you? Um, How was that process? Well, when I wrote The Sexual Paradox, I actually didn't know how to write a book. I was a columnist. I was a newspaper columnist in Canada for the, uh, the national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. And that's how I got started because an agent contacted me who knew me from my columns and said, well, you know, would you like to write a book? What would you like to write about? And that's how I started on that project. And what I essentially did for that book, which I don't recommend, is I wrote 10 I guess, magazine pieces that on a related topic, on the question that I was pursuing, but they sort of stood separately and didn't hang together. And I had to learn how to weave them together after the first draft and, and, and make it all cohere. And so that was the huge challenge of the first book. I sort of felt like, okay, you know, these are the, the chapters. I'll write like a big piece on each chapter and it'll stand alone and speak for itself. And that's actually not a book. I discovered. So um, it took quite, you know, I, I'm a big uh, reviser. I revise many, many times. Like I would say some chapters have four revisions, but some chapters have six revisions. And so the, like I go over everything many, many times. So this book, I didn't have that challenge because I, I sort of knew how to ride the bicycle in a way and knew how to integrate the material. But the challenges, I think, were a little bit different because last for the last book, the material was quite, turned out to be quite controversial. And for this book, sometimes the reaction has been a bit puzzling to me because the information was so new. Some of it is just hot off the press. I mean, some of it was just being published and was still actually unpublished when I incorporated it. 
And yet sometimes the reaction has been like, yeah, duh, we knew that. But that's not, <laughs> but that's not really how people behave, right? They don't behave as if they know the information. Most people spend more and more time alone and online than they ever have before in human history. What is it that you as a writer love about the writing process? What I love about the writing process is solving the puzzle of how to put together the stories that really compel me and I think are really important for the reader to carry the book and carry the reader along. In my view, I want to understand a phenomenon through people's experience. And so the challenge and the pleasure for me is always weaving together people's compelling stories with the science. So the stories carry you along and the science explains what's happening, like why that person's trajectory turned out the way it did. And so for me, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. I'm like, how's it all going to fit together? You know, how am I going to make it flow for the reader? So sometimes, I'll, I'll give you an example, sometimes I'll get to the end of the chapter and I won't know how to throw it to the next chapter like a ball, like a pitcher. And it'll take me sometimes like two, three days to figure out how to make the transition to the subject of the next chapter so that the reader doesn't feel it's clunky or feel that the transition is so obvious to them. The Village Effect is just so packed full of research and different studies. Um, do you do that primarily up front and then begin to write your book or do you sort of do research throughout? Uh, I do both. So you have to do a lot of research to write a book proposal. So because a book proposal has to be stand on its own and convince the agent that he can sell, he or she can sell this book and that there's going to be interest. So you have to do a lot of your homework in advance. But then when you actually get down to writing the book, you have to be up to date because after all, there are huge delays between the time that you finish your and revise your manuscript and the book appears. And it has to be current enough. So plus you have like little questions that appear along the way, such as the introvert question you asked. You know how that came up is that my editor was reading the book and she put in the margin, well, what about me? I'm a huge introvert. Do I need social contact? Right. And this just threw me into a whole line of research that I hadn't even considered before. And I started researching introverts and extroverts and really finding out what, as far as we know right now, what is the answer to that question? And when you first began on this process of writing your first book, how did you find your agent? Well, my first agent found me in the Globe and Mail, and so she, she reached out to me. And my second agent is, uh, so my first agent was a Canadian agent, and um, because my column was a national column in Canada, so that's where a lot of my kind of visibility was. Um, but my second agent is really an agent who specializes in science writing and science writers. So because that's more or less what I'm doing, it made more sense to go with that agency, which really kind of sells books about science and social science. And so um, he actually called me. I kind of put the word out through the network that I was looking for an American agent. And he heard through the grapevine and called me and said, and interestingly, he called me and I had discovered a book that was on a similar topic that was coming out about, I guess, about 18 months before mine. And that disturbed me at first. And he was representing those authors. And I said, well, why would you want to represent me if you have a book on social networks already? And he said, oh, well, by the time your book appears, everybody will have forgotten about that one. And he said, I don't really mind what writers want to write about. I mean, as long as they do a good job of it and I can sell the book, it's fine. So that's a kind of lesson to writers, too, is I found it kind of discouraging at first to find out both for the first and second books that a book on my topic had already been written, right? And then when you realize that you actually have your own voice and your own perspective on the matter, and that's the, I guess, distinguishing factor of why your book is important, why you have to write it. Like, what is your particular point of view that's going to add some spice to the issue? And you're not going to look at it or frame it the same way as another author would. So, you know, that's kind of the way, what I would say to other writers who've discovered, oh no, there's, you know, my, my territory is crowded with other writers who are writing about the same thing. 
Thank you for saying that because I think a lot of people feel that way. They see something come out and they're like, I, I missed my I missed my opportunity, but it's so refreshing to hear that because that doesn't it's not necessarily true. Right. And just think about, for example, the genre of movies, since you know something about movies, right? You can have, you know, various like thrillers or cops and robbers pictures or gang pictures, you know, films. They're not identical. Each one has its own flavor and its own feeling. And that's what the writer puts into the book. You know, just like, you know, even when you follow a recipe, you know, people who like to cook and I like to cook, you know, often share recipes and then they discover the same recipe doesn't come out the same way when you've cooked it. So similarly for writing, you're going to put it together in your own unique way. You're going to revise it in your own unique way. You have your own aesthetic of how the phrases are going to fall, how you're going to present the information. And so it'll be a completely different experience for the reader. And if there's one thing that you've learned from the process of writing, it would be what? I would say persistence. Uh, writing a book is very difficult. Writing in general is very difficult. I say, you know, I, often people will say, oh, you know, I'm a whatever. Say, I'm a surgeon or I'm a social worker. And when I retire, I'm going to be a writer. And I always kind of snicker, maybe unkindly, because it's a very difficult job to do and to do well, and it takes a lot of stick to So as a matter of fact, I was looking for a prop to show you, Ingrid, and I'm hoping <laughs> I'll find it, but what it is essentially is a sheaf of post-it notes. Oh, here it is, where I wrote down my word count every day for th- about three years because I had a deadline. So I thought, well, how am I going to write like 120,000 words? I, I, it just seems so overwhelming. And I just divided it up like month by month, week by week. And if I didn't make my word count that day, I mean, I had to make it up later in the week because I just decided if I wasn't going to write, say, 5,000 words every week, I wasn't going to make my deadline. So it's not a very romantic thing, right? Like this little sheaf of like post-it notes of like little... but. It's just math. You, you take your, your end point and you divide it up into little chunks. You know, Annie Lamott, who's a writer in California, writes, you know, wrote a book called Bird by Bird. That's how you write. You know, it's just little tiny bit by little tiny bit. And another little, before we end, another little clue I would add to writers out there is never, ever delete for good. Like if you're going to change anything, create another file and paste it into another file of leftovers or outtakes. You know how films have outtakes that they show at the end sometimes? Sure, yeah. I have an outtake file for every chapter with everything I've lifted out of the chapter just in case I need it or there's a crash or I lose something. You've got all the little bits and pieces you've cut away. Brilliant. That's a great, great idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I think there's an expression a filmmaker friend of mine told me once. She said, you know, be careful what you leave on the cutting floor, like what you cut out. So from now on, from then on, I never deleted it definitively until the book was published. Well, all your your hard work and being so meticulous with your revisions really shows. I mean, your your book is just the economy of, of words and how you put it together is just really well done. Well, thank you so much, Ingrid, and, and it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. Thank you, Susan.